Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, my name is Laura Dawson. I'm the director of the Canada Institute. For various reasons, some of them being completely beyond my control, i.e. the U.S. government shutdown, this is actually our first official event of, uh, of 2019. So I am delighted that all of you were able to join us. If you are Canada-US watchers and you've been watching the invitations today, uh, there is a hotbed of Canadian activity. So I'm delighted that you've chosen us. Um, and uh, I'm sure one of the reasons why you've chosen us is because we've got such a great speaker. Um, Andrew Cohen uh, has been a friend for a very long time. He has been a, f you are a Fulbright scholar here. Uh, he is now a global fellow. Uh, he is an award-winning journalist, a best-selling author. Uh, his latest book is Two Days in June, John F. Kennedy and the 48 Hours That Made History. Um, what I appreciate most about Andrew is that he is such, a, um, such an articulate uh, communicator on the state of the Canada-US relationship. And he was here at a particularly challenging time when the, the Trump election was taking place. And having Andrew here to comment on that was, was really, really helpful for us. And one of the great things about Andrew is he has no shortage of comments. <laughs> Um, he is also working on a new project uh, that he might tell us about if he's, uh, if he's willing to disclose. Um, but uh, we asked him here today to just talk about the state of Canadian foreign policy. Uh, there's a lot going on, a lot going on in Canada independently. Uh, also, uh, a lot going on in Canada in reaction or relation to what's going on uh, in the world, and in particular in Washington. In some respects, Canada is carving out a new uh, position, role for itself in the world. In other cases, it's uh, carrying on, uh, doing more of the same. So without, uh, without any more of my ranting and rambling, uh, let me turn the microphone over to Andrew, who's going to give some, some opening thoughts, and we'll have a little conversation between us, and then we'll have a little conversation with all of you. Because as I look around the room, we've got some pretty wise analysts and observers from a lot of different uh, policy areas. So I'm anxious to uh, include your views as well. Andrew Cohen, hello and welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you to the uh, Canada Institute, and thank you particularly to Savannah, who organizes these things and has been organizing them on my behalf and on behalf of the Institute for so long. It's, uh, I'm very grateful to her, wh wherever she is. I think she's outside organizing. She's, she's marshalling the food. She hasn't heard the yeah. praise, so it'll, I'm sure it'll get to her. And my friend Laura Dawson, who, uh, is it three years you're running? Three or four now? Yeah, three and a half. Who has breathed new life into this very important, it's an institute, but it's institution and has uh, done extraordinary work in renewing, uh, um, uh, refreshing, uh, recasting, recalibrating. It's really uh, important. When you sit in Canada and realize uh, the need we have for institutions elsewhere to be talking about what we do in the world, there's no one or there's no one anywhere that really does what Laura and the Institute does here. So um, I'm very grateful to be here. I see Chris Sands here. So I'm very grateful to be here. I was here uh, for, uh, I've been here many times, but I was here for an extended period. Uh, I was very pleased to work in the library here. Those of you who worked <laughs> in the library, uh, I had Carol number 38, um, and uh, I was right under the air conditioner. It was so cold, I used to call it a Christmas Carol. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's no fancy treatment for the scholars here. But Just actually, I was, a sweater. I was succeeded in that Carol by uh, Rona Ambrose, I think. If she was, was she ever here? Jim, Jim Prentice. Well, preceded, uh, preceded, I think, yeah. by Jim. And wasn't I succeeded by Rona? Yes. Okay. Sadly, Jim Prentice, yeah. So. And then Tony Keller, I think, occupied that space. By that time, they had fixed the vent because yeah. of your... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I needed a Canada Goose parka. <laughs> Opportunity Canada Goose, which are now going to be manufactured in Montreal. <laughs> um, sure. Um, so uh, the way um, I'm in the hands of Laura and the organizers, but I think that what we've agreed on is that I would just say uh, a few words. Um, uh, so perhaps um, uh, a short presentation, then a conversation, and then we turn it over to you for an interrogation. So <laughs> um, just uh, uh, a few words about Canada and the world. Um, I, um, you know, when a prime minister of Canada is elected, he or she, but it's been he for the most part, um, have two prime responsibilities. 
Uh, one is to uh, secure the unity of Canada, which um, may not seem today as the pressing issue uh, that it has long been, but in, but surviving, the, the survival of Canada with the secessionist forces within it and the forces of fragmentation has always been the foremost responsibility of any Canadian government. The, the second is um, Canada the United States managing our relationship with the United States. I, I'm really not going to talk about either today because um, I think this government has done an excellent job managing the relationship with the United States. And I know there's competition today. At some, there's a conference today, isn't there, on the, the, the free trade agreement? Um, there's hot and cold and, wedding conferences right, everywhere. Right, and, and Laura's, Laura's here and not there, which <laughs> is a great sacrifice. But um, I'm not going to talk about the Canadian-American relationship because uh, I'm going to be, be a little going to go more broadly today and about Canada and the world. But I think that, by and large, uh, while I will not always be complimentary of what I think we're doing in the world, I think in terms of managing this relationship, which is, as I say, a foremost responsibility of the government of Canada, we've done as well as any government could. Um, and particularly, the manifestation of that is the free trade agreement. Well, let's just talk a bit about Canada and the world. And I just have two, two um, observations that I'm going to take, actually, from other people. Um, one is the form of a declaration. It's a headline. It's actually two headlines in the New York Times uh, recently. Um, the two headlines were Canada leading the free world. And two is thank God for Canada. These both were over columns by Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, who, if you follow his work, and I'm a big admirer, I can't say I know him, we've, we've had conversations, but he's a wonderful writer who's absolutely besotted with Canada. And um, <laughs> uh, he travels widely, and he was just in Ottawa, and he got the full treatment from people there because uh, he came away writing about, thank God for Canada. Um, what he says there is, I'm going to quote, Canada be one of the world's most boring countries, as yawn, inspiring, and sensible shoes. Um, but it's also emerging as a moral leader of the free world. By the way, he doesn't say the moral leader. He says a moral leader of the free world. There's no one else, he says. And then he makes an argument for Canada as a moral leader um, in refugees, in human rights, in its um, feminist foreign policy, in the nature of its international aid. So that's a view from the United States of what Canada is doing in the world. That's a declaration. Uh, here's a question. Is Canada a central country at this time in the life of our planet? That actually is not my question. It's a question posed by Christa Freeland, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, in a seminal foreign policy speech she made on June the 6th, 2017. When she talks about Canada as a central, an essential country, she asks the question, she answers it, she says the word is yes. So we have here a view of Canada as a moral leader of the free world and of an essential country in the world. Those are two views of Canada abroad and Canada's foreign policy. Um, and both of them answer it a certain way in a flattering way. I have some reservations about both. And while they can come out in our conversation, I would just simply say that Canada may consider it an essential country, and Canada has done a number of many fine things um, in the last three years under the government of Justin Trudeau and before. In refugees, in human rights, in international aid, in NATO, in peacekeeping at the United Nations, in multilateral institutions. And it would be churlish of me to come here, as it is easy to do, uh, and say that Canada doesn't do many of these things, because it does. My argument about Canada, and it's been my argument since I wrote a book called While Canada Slept about 15 years ago, is that given our history, our geography, our demography, our prosperity, we don't do enough. And so in talking about Canada, whether we're an essential country or a moral country, I would simply suggest to you if we're an essential country, essential to whom? We just might go down a very, very quick list. Essential to whom? Essential to the United Nations? which rejected us as a member of the Security Council in 2010. We are campaigning for that seat on the Security Council again. The vote will be next year. I don't know how it will go. We are not a shoo-in. We were a shoo-in on the Security Council in every decade, in every decade of the UN's existence up to 2010. 
Canada had a rotational seat in the Security Council, which was ours virtually for the asking. Last time in 2010, we mounted a very lackluster campaign. We were uh, up against Portugal and somebody else. I cannot remember the somebody else. And we didn't even get essentially to the, to the second round. It was an embarrassment. This time we're campaigning hard. I hear different things about the status of our application. We're up against Ireland and Norway, both of whom um, have um, some stature in the developing world, particularly Norway, because of the generosity of its aid program. There it is. So we may be an essential nation, but I'm not so sure we're an essential nation in the United Nations. We will see. Are we an essential nation in peacekeeping? Peacekeeping, which was Canada's motto, Canada's emblem, um, Canada's identity for so long, up to about 30 years ago, we were the world's largest peacekeeper. That is in terms of the troops we committed, in terms of the money we committed, in terms of the leadership we offered. We saw it as our international vocation. It wasn't the only thing we did. Our commitment to NATO was far greater. But peacekeeping was, if you ask Canadians in polls how they saw each other and how they saw the country, they would have health care, the wilderness, and peacekeeping. Peacekeeping was such, such a strong sense of the Canadian iconography that even in Afghanistan, people thought that was a peacekeeping mission. It was not, but people thought so and wanted to think so. So are we essential to peacekeeping? We aren't essential to peacekeeping. Before we dispatched 250 soldiers to Mali, which is our, our mission, the first mission we've accepted in some time, and we can talk about that in more detail, but it's a one-year mission. We took it reluctantly, and we can't wait to get out. Um, our mission expires in July. We've been asked by the successing, our succeeding partners, the Romanians, to stay a little longer. We've said no. Um, we are, before we accepted that mission, we were at the lowest number of peacekeepers committed since 1956 when we actually began to do peacekeeping after the Suez Crisis. So are we essential on the UN? Are we essential on peacekeeping? I would say no. Are we essential on human rights? We'll probably end up talking about Saudi Arabia. I will simply say that we have made a lot of flowery, florid, and, and passionate statements about human rights in Saudi Arabia, but it comes down to a number of key things. What are you doing commercially with, uh, with Saudi Arabia? Well, Saudi Arabia, we are still buying its oil, and we are still selling them light armored vehicles, um, uh, which are being used in Yemen to kill people. So. The idea that, that human rights, and we won't talk about China and other places because the, we say some things about human rights, we do other things. Um, on refugees, uh, which was Nick Kristof's uh, particular um, uh, interest, uh, we've done very well on Syrian refugees. We've admitted 45,000 Syrian refugees. And we, for that, we pat ourselves on the back um, with great enthusiasm. Well, okay. We aren't Europe, we're not Angela Merkel in Germany, who has admitted a million refugees. And I don't m say they're comparable because they're not storming our borders. We're not Sweden, we're not a whole host of other countries. On refugees, we are far better than the United States is, but I can just want to note that when we congratulate ourselves in Canada on our refugee policy, and there, it has been, I think, a successful integration, very sadly, by the way, a story this week, um, a number of refugees who had settled in Halifax, a family of seven was, um, was killed in a house fire, including children. Syrian refugees who had done very well in Canada, it's heartbreaking. But on Syrian refugees, for which we congratulate ourselves, and Canada is very good at self-congratulation, we've actually elevated that to a certain national attribute. In 1979, Justin Trudeau's, or actually 1980, but let's say 79, Canada, a country half the size it is today, we're now 38 million, it was then about 18 or 19 million, took from Vietnam something in the order over three years of 70,000 refugees. 70,000. Ottawa, led by Marion Dewar, the mother of the late Paul Dewar, who was in Parliament for 10 years, a New Democratic Party member, had, some, had a project in, a, a commitment in Ottawa called Project 4000. Ottawa alone, city of then probably half a million, took 4,000. I often wonder about that when we, we take 40,000 Syrian refugees and we don't think as big as we might have when we took from Indochina some 70,000. So on refugees, I wonder if we are as good as we say. On foreign aid, which is the last thing I'll, I'll talk about, 
We talk about our um, feminist um, uh, development policy. I don't know what it means. I've been trying to figure out what that means. We, call, we talk about a feminist foreign policy. I'm still trying to see what that means. I'm thinking more and more it's a kind of a moral fig leaf about something. But on, on aid, which we talk a lot about, and we talk about our innovations in aid, let's talk about money. Our percentage of aid is now 0.26% of um, gross domestic product. That is among the lowest of the um, 29 members of the OECD, the average of which is 0.32%. So just to put this in a certain perspective, in 1969, 50 years ago, Lester Pearson, the renowned Lester Pearson, Nobel laureate, Canada's greatest diplomat, committed with other world leaders as part of a World Bank um, uh, panel of eminent persons, committed the nations of the world as a target to 0.7% of, uh, of aid would be committed, of, of gross, um, of wealth, national wealth would be committed to foreign aid, 0.7%. Canada, um, having embraced that and talked about it for many years, it has been 50 years, has never been anywhere near that. The highest we got was around 0.52% under Brian Mulroney, under Pierre Trudeau, we were at 0.5% roughly. So half a percent, not three quarters of a percent, half a percent. Now we're down to one quarter of one percent, which is far off. And it is among the lowest of the OECD nations. So my point is, while we talk about aid, and we talk about, and Nick Kristof talks about our innovations in aid, and I don't want to sound churlish because we are more generous than other nations, but when it comes to commitments made and, and conversations had, we don't do as well as we say we, we are. And there are other countries. They tend to be from Scandinavia, but there are Denmark, uh, Norway, Sweden, have all met 0.7 and exceeded it. Um, Germany is around there. Luxembourg is around there. The, the UK is around there. So it's not just the fabled nations of Scandinavia who make these targets. Other nations make them too, and France has committed. We're not even committing to any figure anymore. What we're talking about is our feminist um, foreign policy, our feminist development policy, which I think means perhaps empowering women in the field. It's a nice idea. We hear from, we hear from our Prime Minister how the world needs more Canada, how Canada is stepping up. Personally, I think there, are, there is some truth to that, but stepping up also means when the bill comes, stepping out. And we've done that for a while. Um, Canada is back, we're, we're, we're told often. Well, in defense spending, in aid spending, Canada is not back. It's, as my friend Robert Greenhill says, we are way back, <laughs> way back in the pack. So what I'm offering you um, is another view of the world's um, uh, essential country, um, the world's moral leader or amoral leader. It's another view. It does not mean to say that we don't do a number of interesting things and we don't do more than 192 other members of the United Nations. But it is, but it, it is to say that um, we should be careful in our self-congratulation, we should be careful in our, um, uh, um, in our rhetoric because there is often a large gap between rhetoric and reality. I'll leave it there. Boy, you kind of set the bar pretty high. One might even say curmudgeon-like. One might even say maybe I should have Crystal on this, uh, Christoph on this side to, to counterbalance He's it. He's a great guy, but I think he, he, by the way, when he wrote that column, he said he heard from a lot of Canadians mm -hmm. about how um, it would be very Canadian to be critical of our government, but he did hear from many of them. So, so how important, though, is it to be best in class? I mean, being reasonable, 38 million people dispersed widely along the U.S. border, having some economic problems of its own, uh, having challenges with the Federation, having challenges with the economy. Um, do we, should we really be aspiring to being best in class on human rights or aid or any of these things? Isn't it enough to just be uh, a strong voice, uh, uh, a trendsetter, be bold from time to time? Can't we just be good enough without being superlative? You mean uh, going for the bronze? <laughs> going for the bronze. Um, no. No, because it betrays our history. No, because we've done better. No, because uh, Canada justly had a reputation a generation ago in the world, and I don't mean to sound 
like I live in a sepia-stained world of nostalgia and sentimentality, but Canada has a responsibility to its birthright. Very few nations are born with the kind of natural wealth Canada has. Um, we virtually, you know, I remember a, 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 a conversation with a European colleague when we were lecturing him. Stephen Harper was very good at lecturing, as was John Baird in the last government, lecturing other countries about deficit and that kind of thing. And he said, oh yeah, well, we, we can all pump oil just like you can. Um, we have enormous resources. We have a history of, um, I think it's a, um, uh, uh, by and large, a, a history of decency and democracy. Um, Canada has never had colonies. Canada has never fought wars of conquest. Canada has never fought alone. It has always fought when it has fought in international coalitions. And it has fought bravely, magnificently, in the First World War, the Second World War, in Korea, in a number of operations since. So if you look at where Canada was um, as a founding member, of, founding member of NATO, and by the way, Lester Pearson always said his proudest achievement was not winning the Nobel Prize in 1957 for what he had done in the Sinai in 1956. It was uh, as one of the architects of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, of which Canada has been a proud member for the last however many 70 years or so. And NATO always did more than peacekeeping, but it was one of the things we, we did. I think if you look at where we were militarily, where we were in terms of our humanitarian aid, and where we were in terms of our influence at the United Nations as a so-called helpful fixer and honest broker, in what was, let us be clear, a different world. I think you say to yourself, well, what can we do today? How can you find a way through to, to being an essential nation? Well, if you really believe in human rights, and you can accept a level of hypocrisy in your foreign policy, which would make you um, not unusual in the world, you could say that we cannot move China. China is what it is, and um, no amount of um, uh, gesturing or no amount of proselytizing um, is going to change China, although you could adopt what the Germans do, which is to have very frank discussions about certain cases in human rights and try and move, the, move things along um, in private. But on Saudi Arabia, actually, you do have a choice. Canada has a very clear choice on Saudi Arabia. Here we have, the, and it's worth lingering if I just might, for, 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 yeah. for a minute, Laura, on Saudi Arabia. So you'll know what happened last uh, summer. Two tweets go out uh, from the personal account, uh, or one did at least, from the personal account of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I don't know if it was just she got up on a Sunday morning and a, on a holiday weekend and felt annoyed about the latest outrage from Saudi Arabia. This is long before Khashoggi. This was the mistreatment of one of the human, of a, um, a leading human rights activist, and she said this is not a good thing. Um, I don't know if she meant it. I don't know if it was. I sense she didn't speak to anybody on the Saudi desk at the time at the Department of Foreign Affairs, Global Affairs in Canada. It went out, and of course, you know what happened. The crown prince went ballistic and decided he would make an example of Canada, so he recalls um, uh, his ambassador to, uh, uh, to Ottawa and throws our ambassador out in Riyadh and, and, and says to the 100,000 Saudi students in Canada, you have to leave. Um, which are, by the way, a very important source of income to Canada, many, many of them in medical school, and fr froze all commercial contacts and, and, and said many other things to make an example of, of Canada. Canada then begins to double down and say, well, that's not a bad thing, and we still believe in human rights, and the Prime Minister made a few statements. But two things didn't change. One was... The Saudi petroleum minister said, he probably didn't get the memo from the crown prince, that uh, actually Canada is still buying the oil. We're happy to sell oil to Canada. We're, we're not happy to do a lot of other things. We're really angry at them, but we're happy to make money and sell you oil, which we don't need. And second is um, the prime minister, having mentioned the uh, uh, $15 billion contract that General Dynamics of London, Ontario has with the government of Saudi Arabia, said, well, we'll look at it. But the truth is that after now six months, seven months, um, suddenly, and after the murder of, of a journalist, uh, which um, uh, has brought no retribution, at least from the administration here, it may from Congress in this country, we have a situation in which nothing really has changed with Saudi Arabia. I think many of those students are still in Canada. We're still buying their oil. And worse, 
we're still selling them light armored vehicles. So Canada had a chance there, an opportunity to actually do something, to actually say there is an element, if you want to be principled on this matter, if you want to talk about human rights the way you do, act on this. But you can also be realistic and understand, and it would be considered hypocrisy by some people, that you can't do it with China. Uh, because it won't make a difference. And maybe, and you had a lot of nice things that you wanted to put in the free trade agreement on women's rights and labor rights and the environment, and it went absolutely nowhere. There was supposed to be a whole chapter, wasn't there, Laura, on, on gender rights? There's a couple of lines of language. But not, there's not a chapter. No, no, and there's, there's no binding obligation. Okay, so the chapter became a few lines, not even a paragraph. Is there a paragraph? It might be a paragraph. Okay, there's a paragraph. It was borrowed from the Chile agreement. Okay, so, all right, and that's what we got on that. So... If you believe in things, so to answer your question, Laura, I'm sorry, it's a long answer. It's a good answer. But, you know, if you believe in things, do them. You have within, there are a number of influential people in Canada saying cancel the contract, including Roland Paris, who was the Prime Minister's foreign policy advisor before he left after eight months. There are things you can do. If you believe in foreign aid, you're a, you're a $2 trillion economy. And Laura, you said we have economic problems. We have the lowest unemployment rate since 1976. We have low inflation and low interest rates. Yes, is it, an, is it a perfect economy? It is not. Is it a Goldilocks economy? It is not. When was the last time we had un unemployment of the levels we now do? 1976. So if you believe, and one of the reasons our aid as a percentage of our aid is dropping is the economy is doing reasonably well. And we're not, we're not keeping pace with it. The British are. The British made this commitment under David Cameron and have largely kept it. So if you believe in things, raise your foreign aid. If you believe in peacekeeping, stop talking about it. And actually, if you believe in it, and there are arguments not to believe in it, but if you do and you still believe it's part of your iconography, do something. Canada's foreign policy beyond the United States has become what I call a gesture a gestural foreign policy. It is one gesture at a time, and it's an illusory foreign policy. It's not that it doesn't do good things, but there's a level of rhetoric unmatched by the reality. In my opinion. Oh, I should also tell you, I, I should have mentioned this before, we're being webcast to all the ships at sea. So uh, don't, don't say anything. And they're not getting the lunch, so they have the worst of both worlds. Don't say anything. Listening to me and having no lunch. In my opinion. <laughs> I think the foreign policy actions that Canada does best are those that they do in concert with other countries, uh, where they do the things that they do well. And you said, you know, honest broker and that whole soft power thing. But I think that is gen genuinely an area of, of strength. Um, I s have, you know, can the Canada-U.S. relationship has been under challenge, particularly in the economic area and particularly in the Twitter sphere over the past year or so. But I look at something like Venezuela, and I see that as being a really good example of Canada doing what it does well, which is negotiation and brokerage and, and slow communication through the Lima Group and other allies, uh, and the US doing what it does well, which is stomping in and saying, my way or the highway, and that those things can be a bit of a, uh, a, a virtuous circle, that there is a synergy there. And I don't think, I, I think there was a fair amount of coordination between the U.S. position and the Canadian position. Otherwise, why was Christopher Freeland here talking to Mike Pompeo repeatedly uh, over, over the past several months? So what do you think about Canada being a bit of a wingman for the U.S. or acting in concert with other countries? Are there opportunities there that are either being taken advantage of that we need to know more about or are, are you know, unrealized? There are certainly huge opportunities. And that is essentially, in fairness, and I'd recommend Krista Freeland's speech to you. She gave it in Parliament June 6, 2017. There are certainly opportunities there. And one of the reasons, and Nick Kristof, for example, makes the argument about Canada as a moral leader is largely it's by default. He will talk about the United States taking no almost no refugees from Syria. He'll talk about the United States saying nothing, not a discouraging word about Saudi Arabia. That is the president. Congress may act differently, but the president is not. He'll talk about the challenges of succession in Germany, which have preoccupied Angela Merkel, who for me is the heroine of Europe and how she acted on the Syrian crisis. How Britain is um, obviously tied down um, with Brexit and doesn't really know what it, uh, it's doing and is in some, um, some trouble. France has got its own problems. And so you might say by virtually by default, Canada's actions in a number of areas, and I salute those, and you're right, on the Lima Group, on the White Helmets, there are things we have done 
These don't cost us anything, so we do them, and that's good. And you could not do them at all. So let us praise those things that Krista Freeland does, whether, um, you know, they're not, um, they're not blind to the political uh, and public relations benefits. That woman who, from Saudi Arabia in January, was it January or December, who was in a hotel room in, um, in Bangkok, I forget her name, so you'll excuse me, um, who uh, we took, we took. Uh, I, have refugee, I have refugee lawyer friends who say, well, that was all very nice, but what about all those other people in the queue who didn't look like her, who were not able to tweet from a hotel room in Saudi Arabia, and who were not met at the airport by the Minister of Foreign Affairs as she was. So this government knows how to take advantage of situations. By the way, Justin Trudeau also met at the airport the first Syrian refugees and gave them a selection of toques and coats. Um, so that they Nothing would be warm. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. That's <laughs> Canadian generosity. And by the way, I don't in any way mean to disparage the extraordinary generosity of 30,000 families in Canada which have taken refugees. It's really a marvelous thing. So that's not my point here. My point is not to be churlish or, or disparage the good things we do. It's to perhaps address that um, yawning gap between the rhetoric and the reality and say, yes, you're a wealthy country, Yes, you have ideals, you have uh, geography, and you have history, and you have advantages, three oceans to begin with, which separate you from uh, the great migration crises that Europe is going through. So what do you do with that? And I think this government is a piece with the Harper government and the Chrétien government that Canada for the last 30 years, really, since it began to withdraw from certain roles in the world, and perhaps that's reflected in its trouble with the United Nations and its falling stature in Africa and the developing world, has just not done things that we used to do. Uh, the world um, is uh, important to us in terms of trade. We say certain things at certain times, and I'm glad we lend our support to diplomatic efforts. 20 years ago, it was Blood Diamonds and the International Criminal Court, and I salute Canada for doing that. My argument has been, it remains today, that given our advantages, given our blessings, given our benefits, we could do much, much more. Smaller countries do more with what they have than we do. And it's a choice we make, um, and it, or a choice we don't make. But what is particularly striking are the grandiloquent statements that are being made by the Prime Minister and others about Canada being back and this, this, and this. Well, Canada may be back and it may be doing what it's doing, but it largely is because others have left the field and have left Canada alone, which is a statement on the international system, sadly, and what is happening here and elsewhere. But I don't think it's the quite the um, declaration of praise, the good housekeeping seal of approval that Canada thinks it should get. Um, I will be opening it up to questions in, in five or six minutes. I just want to uh, give you a heads up now. Be thinking of your questions or statements framed in the form of a question with a question mark at the end. <laughs> um, one of the things that book writers like you and Chris Sands do is take a step back from uh, the day-to-day -day and the immediate and the policy dramas and try to find some trends, try to find some, some long-term uh, directions or insights that can be used to guide future activities. So you're a university professor, Carleton University, Norman Patterson, Norman Patterson or the School of Journalism? Both. 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 Wow. So uh, compare and contrast, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the old exam question. Right. Yeah, go on. The, go on. Uh, the, the, the Harper foreign policy era would be characterized as X. The early Trudeau foreign policy era would be characterized as blank. That's a good question. I love the compare and contrast. I haven't <laughs> heard that since. Um, there are columnists in Canada, one of my old friend, John Ibbotson, who wrote a, a biography of Stephen Harper. Imagine spending three years studying the life of Stephen Harper. <laughs> but he did, and he's a great guy. He was the former Washington. He was my successor here at the Globe and Mail. I was here for several years at the Globe and Mail's correspondent, and, J and John succeeded me. He sees no difference between the Harper foreign policy and the Trudeau foreign policy. He thinks they're actually on the Middle East, and so many other questions, they're, they're very uh, clear. I actually see some differences. So I would say the Harper foreign policy was a reaction to Personian liberalism, uh, which had guided Canada for so long. The Harper foreign policy was one of, um, I would say it was more ideological. It um, uh, was not 
uh, beyond uh, lecturing countries on deficit financing, uh, on human rights. Um, uh, famously, Stephen Harper began with a very difficult relationship with China. He didn't visit China for the first two years he was in office. And when he got to China, he was rebuked publicly by the leadership, as he had been by Canadian business, and he changed his tune on, on China. But I would say that that government, under John Baird particularly, was the foreign minister, was very um, loud and boisterous foreign minister, would go to the United Nations and lecture um, uh, uh, the world. Um, the Trudeau government is a return to, I use the terms, personian liberalism. Uh, and for those who didn't study history at Carleton University, that's a reference to Lester B. Pearson. Right. So Lester B. Pearson was our uh, Canada's greatest diplomat. Uh, for 10 years was Canada's foreign minister, won the Nobel Prize in 1957 for his work defusing the Sinai, uh, the Suez Crisis in, the, uh, in uh, 1956, later became Prime Minister of Canada, 1963 to 1968. Um, his view of the world was one of an engaged Canada, a generous Canada, a Canada which uh, would lead the world in humanitarian aid, at least given its resources, would be a uh, would be a voice of the dispossessed in the world and, and tried, um, would um, make peacekeeping one of its vocations without in any way um, compromising its commitments to NATO, maintaining a strong uh, standing army. He came out of the World War II generation. In his case, it was actually World War I, but he had been in London during the Second World War and found that Canada, although it is a small country, to answer your question, Laura, had ambition. And I think one of the um, I would like to think that uh, the Trudeau government has ambition, that it likes to talk about a feminist foreign policy. It likes to talk about a commitment to peacekeeping. It likes to talk about a commitment to a, um, a renewed United Nations and what we might do in, in, in reform there. Canada has openings. You, you always have openings. Um, if you believe in human rights, you have to act on it. If you believe in, in a, a, a future for peacekeeping and the reduction of international conflict, you can, you can do that. If you believe in UN reform, you can suggest it. There are things smaller countries can do. Canada largely does some things, and then it talks about the rest, and that's my complaint about my country. It talks about a lot of things and doesn't walk through them. So we can do things. I think the Harper government uh, would say they concentrated on trade. Um, but this government, it, it did sign TPP. It has done NAFTA, despite uh, Mr. Harper's, um, by the way, uh, harping from the, uh, from the margins about it. I mean, his, his uh, frankly, criticism of the government, where other conservatives like Brian Mulroney were aligning themselves with the liberals and trying to get a deal, Stephen Harper, strangely, was saying a number of other things. But I think that this government has done a reasonable job on trade. I think it's done an excellent job on the United Nations, uh, sorry, on, um, on the United Nations and, uh, uh, sorry, the United States. And I think that it can do more if it wants to, but I also believe that beyond Christopher Freeland, there isn't a big constituency for foreign policy in the Prime Minister's office uh, or in the Prime Minister himself. He's not his father's son who, uh, he, ha he has his pedigree, but he doesn't have the same instinctive commitment to the world that Pierre Le Trudeau had. And I think he, he's happy with an image of socks, selfie, and celebrity. But I think he also, uh, and he likes to do what he does abroad, but I think it's largely one of gesture. Thank you. You're wearing very nice socks too, by Thank the you. way. It's a Canadian <laughs> thing. <Thank you. laughs> uh, so I'm gonna open it up to, to questions, and I also just wanna note that we, we run on the, <laughs> Uh, on the backs and on the brain power of, of so many people who contribute to our, to our organization in so many different ways. Uh, I'm looking at Tony Wayne and Chris Sands, who are just uh, 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 very, very solid contributors uh, to, to what we do. But we also have a thing called Global Fellows, and our room is chock full of Global Fellows. Andrew, you're a Global Fellow. Uh, Jim Dickmeyer, Global Fellow. 
Rich Sanders, about to become a Global Fellow. Both of these folks are alumnus from the, uh, the, the State Department. Uh, Jackie O'Neill, Security Specialist and Global Fellow. Audrey Makapada, uh, I can't call you an alumnus from the Government of Canada. You're uh, <laughs> Government of Canada at large. Uh, and it's, it's these folks that uh, really give us the, the inspiration and, and impetus on, on so many different ideas. Did I miss any Global Fellows? Okay, good. Uh, questions for or comments for Andrew? Yes, ma'am. And please, I think we have to use a microphone because we're broadcasting to all the submarines and ships at sea and the whole World Wide Web. And please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. I'm Elaine Zuckerman. You may remember. I remember. We're, we're ex cousins <laughs> through marriage. <laughs> I, I hope it didn't Andrew end Andrew and I. Not our marriage. Not our marriage. My question's about current. Canadian Chinese relations. Um, I think I read in the sparse news we get on Canada's foreign policy here that, and, and this is what I want clarification on, that perhaps Canada was on the verge of signing a trade treaty with China just at the moment when the US required Canada to arrest Meng Wanzhou, and we know about the reason for that and all the fallout. I have very strong opinions about why that happened. My question's not about that. It's about what is the status of Canadian-Chinese relations since that incident? Um, how was trade disrupted, if it was at all? Um, can Canadians travel to China? I'm still a Canadian citizen, although I've lived here for decades. Um, should I fear traveling there now? Those kinds of questions, thanks. So Elaine Zuckerman used to be called, I don't know if we still use the word Sinologist, do we still use that word? Uh, and one of the best ones, so thank you for your, your question. China is a conundrum for Canada now. I, I'm gonna defer to Laura on the trade. I think the trade thing was falling apart before this, but I'm gonna defer to Laura on that. We have worked to, to get a trade agreement. I think the Chinese were put off by some of the more progressive elements that we thought we would um, would be part of it. So I don't know where that is. I do know there is a lot of discussion in, in Canada about how we could have handled the whole extradition question that we're now, and how we find ourselves between two superpowers, um, and how uh, difficult and uncomfortable that position is. Um, I have people saying, I hear people saying that um, we should have told um, uh, that executive not to get on that airplane. Um, uh, but then when I'm, I hear that, people would have said, well, if we had done that, we would have violated whatever obligations we have to the United States. I don't know how that all turns out. It is not something that is good for us. I don't know how it ends well for us. I think it either alienates the United States, and we've seen where that can lead us. And the, by the way, as we know, the free trade agreement has not yet been ratified by, um, by Congress. So I, I don't know where that's going, but it's not. So... <laughs> And the, the president says things about that. And our desires, our, um, our ambitions for China. Um, just so you know, uh, our trade with China, um, when you look at our total trade picture, is small. It's important, but it's small. Um, our first obligation, as always, has to be the United States of America. So I think that we will come down at one point or another on that side because we have to. But I, I don't know where things are now, and I don't think that trade deal is happening soon. And I think that um, China has become, when they started to pick up Canadians, um, I have friends who, uh, are, uh, who will not go to China now. I personally wouldn't go to China now. If you are picking up people on the streets, is it three now? Um, I wouldn't go to China as a Canadian. I don't know if the Department of Foreign Affairs has issued a travel advisory. Uh, that would be interesting. Do you know? Um, does any, have they not? They have not, uh, because when they do, that um, elevates things. But I would not go to China, now. So I was in Ottawa this week for a, for a trade conference, and so smarter people than me were talking about China, so I'm not presuming to be an expert, but I'm just repeating some of the things that were discussed, uh, including a conversation with uh, a current Canadian official in China. Uh, one of the things that she said is at the official levels, uh, there has been a, you know, a, a stall, a slowdown, a freezing in informal relations. Uh, but uh, buyers and sellers, Canadians and Chinese, continue to 
work together, continue um, the trajectory of their business deals. And so I, I think it's quite unlikely um, that we would see a travel advisory that would affect that, that business, uh, a business community. But the question uh, I would have, anyone would have traveling to China is, am I important enough to be a target? Mm -hmm. Flip a coin. Um, were any of those three important? I mean, some were. One was a former diplomat, but wasn't one a, a business person? I mean, who were they important in of themselves? Uh, two of them were. Two of them, but the third yeah. one I thought wasn't. Yeah. Okay. But also drug charges and okay. yeah, other yeah. things. So yeah. um, the, the Huawei issue will play itself out, and lots of armchair quarterbacks will, will weigh in on what Canada should have done and could have done and what the U.S. could have done and should have done. Uh, at the same time, Canada is a rule of law uh, country, and it was following some very set procedures on extraditions and responding to a, to a, US, to a U.S. request. Uh, as as uh, Andrew says, the Canada-China free trade agreement was not going anywhere. It was a very interesting idea and, and one that I worked on when I was back in Canada looking at the economic analysis. It makes sense from an economic perspective, um, but much of the market access that one might be able to achieve on paper may not be access that you could practically achieve because of all of the non-tariff barriers and uh, challenges with doing business in China. The real conversation, the real dynamism on China is US-China. And I think Canada will probably step back and watch to see how that plays out uh, and punt its major decisions down the road until that is that, that relationship is, is clearer. Mr. Sands. Mr. Sands. Dr. Chris Sands. Mm -hmm. th th thank you very much, Laura. And, and I've been reading you, Andrew, f since I was just a tadpole of Canadian studies because <laughs> you've always had that kind of insight. You were that. never a tadpole. Well, I had legs, but you know, sort of. <laughs> um, but a creature in the swamp for sure. Um, so I, re I, really, I really appreciate the insight you always bring, not only to foreign policy, but to Canada-US relations. So I'm going to draw you into that territory you, you didn't want to talk about and ask whether some of what ails Canadian foreign policy is actually a made in Washington problem, that the US isn't doing what we used to expect it to do in terms of alliance leadership. Um, you think about the Saudi case that you mentioned. Uh, in another era, JFK, Eisenhower, pick your president, there would have been phone calls to tell both sides to cut it out and things would have been smoothed over because they're both allies of the US for better and worse and the fighting is not good for the side. If you look at the China case, a different administration might well have said, you don't have a problem with Canada, you have a problem with us. So pick on somebody your own size and let's deal with this face to face. It's a schoolyard maybe, but still, we would have taken that heat away from you. But we're not doing those things. We're actually making things somewhat worse because we're undermining the case that many Canadians have that good canada relations are worth putting up with occasional American great power uh, behavior because it's so important the trade, because we're challenging our trade relationship with you. And uh, talking even casually about, well, maybe we will, won't have NAFTA and we won't have Canada in our trade agreement. So I, I'm not disagreeing with your thesis in terms of how Canada's managing, but I wonder if you could reflect on whether there is some blame to be laid here uh, for some of why Canada's struggling now. Well, if you're Canada and suddenly um, having been blessed with uh, the best neighbor you could have. And I always tell my students that. I think, um, you know, if you're Poland, you worry about your neighbors. You've had some experience between Russia and Germany, and you're maybe not so warm to Poland. We've blessed to have the United States as our neighbor, and I think the United States has been blessed to have us as our neighbor. Suddenly, and we have both invested in the international system. So we both have these principles, and Canada has always found its identity in the, in the multilateral system as a counterweight to the United States. So you believe in collective security. You believe in free trade. You believe in international collaboration and cooperation, multilateralism. And suddenly, somebody arrives uh, who isn't John F. Kennedy or Dwight Eisenhower or, or anybody else you recognize, and challenges all those notions, the principles of the international system which you have believed in and invested in. So what do you do? That's what, that's what this speech is all about. It's the opening for Canada. This is the speech Christian Freeland gave about Canada being an essential country, that suddenly 
when the field, the landscape is so changed, you have opportunities. But do you welcome those opportunities? What do you think of those opportunities? Are you happy to have them? Not, not entirely. So much of it is. I mean, we, we react as we always do. The elephant sneezes and we all catch cold. Um, and that's what I think we're seeing. So yes, a lot of it is, Chris, a lot of the problem is here. And I should return to what I said earlier, which is we can sit here and talk about Canada and the rest of the world, but if the American relationship isn't right, it doesn't matter. Our prosperity, our security, our imagination is inextricably linked to this country. And so managing this, and as I, I'll repeat, I think we've done a good job given the challenges. I mean, who, when was the last time you host a G7 meeting and one of the guests insults everybody, including the host? <laughs> That's what happened, and, and amid great um, efforts to avoid that. So you're more of a specialist, Chris, than I am on this country, but I do believe you have a, a very strong point, as always, and that is that, uh, yes, a lot of what we do is in reaction to now what is happening here and trying to pick up pieces, not always successfully. Yeah, I, I would just chime in. First of all, on the economic relationships, 70, most people in the room knows, knows this because I've been preaching it for years. 75% of Canadian exports go to the United States. Second largest trading partner, United States, or, uh, China, 3%. 75, 3. It's a big, it's a big difference. But I, I think also, um, uh, Chris, your, your point is, uh, is right on that, uh, Venezuela, as I said, is a good example of how we have worked together and how we continue to work together. But with the China situation, there just seems to be some miscalls, some misconnections. And I think that Canadians are off balance. And that automatic response of cooperation is no longer there. It's a much more wary Canada. And as John Manley says, it's the first time that Canada has really had to go it alone without the warm bath of Britain, without the, the backup of, uh, of the United States. I see Jackie at the back and then Audrey. Jacqueline. Thanks. I'm Jackie O'Neill, a proud global fellow here. And I echo, I also have read you for a very long time and read while well, Canada slept at a very formative time in my own career as a Canadian. And it was really influential for me personally. So um, I want to say I continue to agree with you on a, a lot of the things related to scale and what additional elements we can be contributing. And also want to challenge you because I think you're in your kind of being flippant or skipping over the feminist foreign um, assistance policy and the feminist international um, policy or foreign policy, you're really missing a big part of what Canada's current footprint is in the world. And I think the feminist international development assistance policy, you can read extensively about it. 95% of our aid has to go to projects supporting women and girls. And it's not about empowering women in the field, it's about fundamentally reordering politics. I think we've also seen a lot of Canadian influence, both in leadership and modeling, but also rhetorically, as well as actually on the ground, both at the UN, not, I, I'm in a camp, I don't think us sending 200 more peacekeepers is gonna be as influential as it is with us trying to create an entire initiative within troop and police contributing countries to get more uniformed women in peacekeeping missions, which is what we're doing. So I think we're not doing things in a traditional way, but I do really wanna push back that I think that's, it's a, it's a component that is being noticed. And on the Saudi tweets, you know, Christopher Freeland did not wake up and all of a sudden have a bad day and decide to tweet. You can see redacted documents that have been shared about messages back and forth between embassies and the mission advising her to do this. And then a very deliberate response back. Yes, we didn't cancel the contract. I think it would have cost something in the order of a billion dollars. And my sense is that Canadians would not want us to stand up for our principles for the sake of a billion dollars. But I do hear constantly traveling the world, women from Sudan, from Indonesia, from Saudi itself saying, we appreciated your foreign minister saying this. So I just wanna encourage you to dive deeper into that area because it's not superficial at this stage. It's also not superfluous. It's not irrelevant to the way that we're being seen in the world. And I think it's a really unique contribution. Thank you. And by the way, Jackie is, Jacqueline is one of the most dynamic thinkers about women in security that I know. She's, uh, she's terrific and we're delighted to have a Canadian in Washington doing that kind of stuff. Audrey. So, so can I just answer that? Yes. Yeah. No, um, so no. No? <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Um, I'd refer you to, um, I don't mean to be flippant about the feminist foreign policy. I just don't know what's there. And I do mean that. I don't know what's there. I know there are a lot of um, aspirations. I would refer you to a blistering piece in The Nation two weeks ago uh, from a uh, Pakistani um, aid specialist, a woman, who says uh, there is nothing in it. 
um, and she looked at the Oxfam Canada report and finds very little in it. I am glad if we're aspirational, and I'm glad if it makes a difference. I wonder if we're paying for it, and I'm not so sure we are. Maybe we are. On Saudi Arabia, well, um, maybe they thought it all through. And maybe if they thought it all through, then I guess they wouldn't have been caught if they were flat-footed by the response from the crown prince. And I'm glad we, we did that. Um, but um, where I would disagree with you is, well, yes, I do think we should cancel the contract. And I do think it's worth a billion dollars. I actually think it's a lot more. I think that's why they're not doing it. I would also be a little bit happier if they leveled with us. And if they just didn't issue, if they did more than issue tweets and made declarations, that if they actually said, these are the concrete steps we are, beside lending moral support, and I believe that's important, but you, there's a whole argument that with uh, some countries it, 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 it doesn't do any good at all. That, for example, with the Chinese, public statements do no good at all. You have to do it privately. I don't know. But I, I, I do think that if we really are serious about human rights, we take measures as a nation. We just don't talk. <clears throat> so that's where I would respectfully disagree. But I, and I'm glad to hear, uh, because you would know more about the feminist foreign policy than I do, that there's something there. But I can tell you, I would refer you to a, a number of people who've looked at it who said there isn't that much there. But I'm going to defer to you and hope there is. I really do hope there is. But I know we're not spending a lot of money. Uh, I've got Audrey and Jamie, and, and I've got two minutes left. So Audrey, quickly, Jamie, and I'm sorry, the lady with the beige jacket, and we're going to have to do it in the, in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, Laura, thank you. Uh, Audrey McWeather, I am a Global Fellow Healer here at Wilson. Um, so Andrew, it's, it strikes me that part of your frustration is the stagecraft, statecraft game and, and the perception that the stagecraft, which this government is objectively very good at, is not being backed up by the statecraft. And although stagecraft and statecraft, the divide has always existed, the tools of stagecraft have changed a lot with social media and polling and all this. And, and my question for you, and so, you know, maybe the lady, the, the Saudi refugee who came in highlights that, that there's huge statecraft, stagecraft gains to letting in somebody who can tweet and looks the part, but it might not actually be great statecraft on the, on the grand scheme. My question for you is around the trend. Given the way technology is going, and given that you can really get the stagecraft gains, and I don't mean just this government, I mean any government can start winning stagecraft gains without actually doing the underlying statecraft more and more, especially on matters of foreign policy where there's so much information asymmetry. Is this just the future in, in your mind? That do people, do countries have any reason to go out and spend money on aid when you can get the credit without actually spending the cash? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm not saying that's what they're doing, but I'm asking in, in, it's, it's, in your world. Yeah. You know, it, it's actually very interesting. Maybe it's all that this is the way things are done. It's a matter of image and gesture. And, and by the way, I mean, if you lend support to people, and I take Jackie's point, um, better we, you know, I'm, I'm proud that we are aligning ourselves with progressive people in the world. I just wish we'd back it up a little bit. But I'm, I, I, if, if those, if we in our statements are giving courage to people in hard places who are, whose lives are in danger, good for us. I just would like to see us do more than that and not to be hypocritical about it. But I do believe democracy by tweet will, will increasingly be the way of the world. And so it may not be what you do, it may be what you say. Ambassador Jam James Lambert, Canadian at the Organization of American States. The last word is yours. Last question is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Laura and uh, Mr. Cohen. I just want very, very quickly to, to jump in on the on the gestural. I, I'd say, as a former Canadian diplomatic practitioner and now at the at the OIS, I'd say some elements seem more gestural than than others. And and, and I th I think, in particular, Laura already made reference. Uh, to Krisha Freeland's great activity on Venezuela, on Canada's leadership on Nicaragua, has been very, very important, tangible, and real in the Americas. On the feminist foreign policy side as well, working in an organization that receives Canadian funds, I can back up what Jackie was saying, which is to assure you that in order to access Canadian funding, we have to align our programming to very clear criteria from the government of Canada about how that benefits gender issues and women uh, in, in the region. And not only that, coming out of the Summit of the Americas, Canada launched an initiative that has us the, the coordinating what the inter-American system is doing together uh, to drive the gender agenda uh, with dollars greatly larger than those that are operated by Canada. So, so there's some creativity and, and some, something that's real and tangible there. 
where I'd like to ask you a quick question is, is going, the last 10 years I spent under the Harper government, they were pretty bleak years for Canadian uh, diplomats, and the Trudeau government promised uh, a change, and I fear some of that may be more gestural uh, than, than, than real. Uh, I think we see with the uh, removal of Ambassador McCullum, McCallum uh, in, in China that, I, I mean, I think if, if diplomatic colleagues, Guy Saint-Jacques or uh, um, uh, 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 David Mulroney had been in, in place, you might not have seen that situation come to the fore. I just wonder, are, are we investing sufficiently in the machinery of our Canadian foreign policy and in imp improving that, or is that gestural? I think we're probably not making the investment we should. Um, we probably are not, and we haven't, um, which is one of my laments and has been for 15 years. Um, just to return, I, I'm pleased to hear what you tell me, and Jackie, and I don't mean to be uh, superficial about it. If we are, in our goals, attempting to do things differently and to raise the stature of women, terrific. What makes me suspicious is that we're using that as a fig leaf to a degree, rhetorically and otherwise, um, to obscure what we're not doing. And what we're not doing is we are not reaching meeting commitments that we had long decided we should. And so we can change the conversation to how we are allocating and using money, and that's a good thing. But it is not a good thing if you allow Canadians to believe you are progressive and generous when you may be progressive but not generous. So that's what I guess is bothering me ab about this conversation, that it is being used for other purposes, and it's getting away with diplomacy, it's pinch-penny diplomacy. And w this has been our ethic for a long time. We had an excuse to do this in the 90s under Jean Chrétien when we had to make big decisions about deficits. We don't have to make those today. We are blessed with prosperity and we are still not meeting commitments financially that we could be meeting. So that's my reservation about that. But I'm glad to hear that philosophically and thematically we are shifting and raising the statue room and that's fine. Thank you, Andrew. This has been the best kind of conversation because it's been a, a, a spirited conversation between friends. Neither one of us, I think, we're quite sure what we're going to talk about. Well, and being Canadians, it's with respect. Yes, with respect. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, all of you, for, for your participation here. Uh, thank you to my team at Wilson, to Mariana, to Savannah, to Jacqueline Orr for their great work, and to our external relations team, Ryan and Mackenzie. Thank you for, for all of your help. Thank you for all, to all of you for attending and to our financial partners who make all of this worthwhile. Thank you as well and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.